good to have you both here. Well, hopefully you're at the right place. <laughs> Don't run away from us. So our objective this afternoon is just a very brief overview. We normally do this as a, at least a half day session, but looking at ways that organizations and people in organizations can support women, colleagues, those around them, and of course, friends, relations, and anyone else that we know who may be going through the menopause transition. We'll have a look at how women might be affected and nothing is compulsory. We'll talk about some various things. Uh, different women are affected to different extents with different things. So nothing's compulsory, but it's just an awareness raising thing. We'll look at the evidence that we find about what women say they would like to help to support them. We'll have a look at why, or, why on earth organizations should bother with this stuff. What's the point? And we'll have a look at how we can create a win-win situation to collaborate with everyone and make this transition for the person involved as easy and pleasant for everyone as possible. So this is one of our favorite quotes from the esteemed Mr. Bowie. Aging is that extraordinary process where you become the person you always should have been. And I don't know about your experience, but my experience is working with older people that's certainly the case. They tend to lose their inhibitions. They're not worried quite so much what other people think. And they become the real person, if you like, in inverted commas. And we just like that. So a couple of questions just to kick us off. I don't know, have you been aware of anyone? Do you think you're aware of anyone around you experiencing the menopause? If you are, what did you observe in them? And what made you think it was the menopause possibly that's responsible for it? Do you want anyone to kick off? Yes, please do, just shout out. Yeah. Well, I'm surrounded with a lot of people who are experiencing who are, or have been going through the menopause. Mm -hmm. And I probably could um, be struck off at the minute, but I'm going to put myself in one of those brackets. Okay, right, okay. okay. And um, what, what um, have, you, have you actually spoken to them about it or have you observed things and you think they're going through the menopause? Um, yes, I've spoken to people. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a trade unionist, I'm an active trade unionist. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is one of our, and I'm very much involved in the women's group. And this is, we often have sort of conversations or workshops about right. this these issues right. so we, we found that trade unions are very supportive of our work in the menopause we've done some work with a number of unions including the police federation and, and people like that so that, that's very good thank you for that so let's let's move on the important thing about the menopause is it's a transition it's yeah do you want to take a yeah, go on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it is an, an important thing to remember it is natural. Not every woman will experience pregnancy and childbirth, but every woman, if she lives old enough, will experience the menopause. So it is um, a global female experience. It is something that, as women, we will all experience if, if we live to that age. And the important thing to remember is it is a transition, so it isn't permanent. It, it does have a beginning, it does have a middle, and it does have an end. It can go on for a long time, but it does have an end, so it is not permanent. And looking at, as Roger said, nothing is obligatory in, in terms of experiences and severity of symptoms, actually about 25% of women will sail through the whole process and wonder what all the, all the fuss is about, as a lot of women will sail through periods uh, and don't have any problems at all, whether other women are in agony with really really bad PMT every single month for roughly 40 odd years. So as our experience of periods are unique to each and every one of us, so is our experience of the menopause. So some women, about 25% will sail through. About 50% will have moderate to occasionally severe experiences that on the whole, they feel able to manage, but every now and again could derail them. And about 25% of women feel that they are on the edge for the whole of the transition, which could be 10, 12 years. Unfortunately, I was in that 25%. So for me, it was very discombobulating and very nearly did completely derail me until I found out how I could support myself. So as far as other people are concerned, whether that's in a woman's personal life or her business and professional life, 
is to remember that women aren't doing it on purpose. That we, we actually do not have any control over what our hormones are doing to us throughout this transition. They do actually, they run us from puberty to postmenopause. We are dictated to by a big degree by our hormones, some women less than others, some women very severely. But generally speaking, we have no control over what our hormones do to us. And while we're fertile, usually that we're able to manage that. But in the perimenopause, which is when the, the symptoms are at their most severe, it, for some women, it can be completely discombobulating. Um, can I just interact? Um, yes. They are women. Um, I've had conversations with women who you don't necessarily, they didn't necessarily have to be at a certain age. Mm -hmm because of probably um, medical intervention mm -hmm. or medication that menopause has been thrust upon them. Yeah. And they don't, they're not probably the one of the 25% women who sail through it. They yeah. have it severely. Yeah. They're likely to, I mean, it can be a chemical menopause. So if a woman has to have a full hysterectomy, that will bring on her menopause immediately. She comes around from the anesthetic. And um, sometimes chemotherapy can bring on an early menopause. Uh, even a partial hysterectomy can, can trigger the menopause. And some women naturally have it earlier than others. So a natural age is from 45 onwards. Anything between 40 to 44 is called an early menopause. And under the age of 40, it's called a premature menopause. And certainly for the women who have it thrust upon them virtually overnight, it, it, they are, you're absolutely right, Sharon, they're unlikely to be in the 25% that sell through because they don't have time to adjust to it. Uh, we, we've had, sadly, had a lot of experience of women going through that. And unfortunately, the medical profession often, too often, fails to advise them of what might happen after a hysterectomy or maybe some radiotherapy or something. Absolutely. And so they get thrust into it. And the sort of answer they get is, well, you know, we're, we're the... We're the oncologists, we're the cancer specialists, we're not, we're not the endocrinologists, we're not the, the menopause guys. It's like, well, you know, you know this is going to happen, it's something you should yeah. advise people of and help them if they need that help. Yeah, yeah it's a really good point. Uh, we regard the midlife years for the sake of what we're talking about today as between 40 and 60. So you'll say, yeah, that's a really long time, and we'll totally agree with you, it is a very long time. But because of the fact it can affect us at different, different times, and that was also true of men going through midlife. Uh, that sort of 40 to 60 covers most people. Some it can be even earlier than that, from 30, 35 upwards. Some it can be a lot later in the 50s, late 50s, even early 60s. But that, roughly speaking, 40 to 60 is, is the is sort of the main group. I would guess probably about 90% or more of people will go through. I mean, about 75, 80% of women will go through the, the, the menopause cutoff date, which is a medically imposed date, somewhere between the ages of 50 to 52. And the perimenopause can start anything up to 10 years before that cutoff date. Uh, and then it takes a few years for everything to settle down. So that's another reason 40 to 60 are the key menopause midlife years for women. And also for men, they can, they can go through their own midlife, usually in the same decade. So it covers both genders. So if we look at the potential business impact, when women were asked by a UK report to comment on the experiences that they were having through the menopausal transition that could have and were having a negative impact on them at work, these are the stats that came up. So feeling irritable was number one at 56%, poor concentration, tiredness, poor memory, emotional impacts so of feeling depressed, and it can be the, the invisible impact of this transition that can be the most distressing for a lot of women. You know, we, we kind of know that our body may start aching and we have hot flushes, although not every woman will experience either of those, but it's a bit that we can't see. So the, the psychological, emotional well-being impact can be really depressing and really difficult for women. Uh, and that has uh, an impact on everything else. So we feel uh, our confidence has been shocked a bit. Of course, the hot, if we get night sweats as well as hot flushes, our sleep is disturbed. And we all know how, regardless of age or gender, how quickly sleep deprivation can have a knock-on impact on virtually everything else that, that we do and how we feel. Uh, and the, the joint and muscular aches uh, and the mood swings. And most of this is down to estrogen, about 75% of what women experience through the transition is caused by the dip in estrogen and about 25% by the dip in testosterone. 
It's interesting, of course, that all of these, I'm going to call them symptoms, of course, they're not symptoms because it's not a disease, but it's the easiest word to use, so excuse me for using it. All of these symptoms, with inverted commas, are linked together. As Katie said, if you have problems with sleeping, your concentration's probably going to go. You're probably going to be a bit more irritable. It, I am. So, you know, it's going to happen, isn't it? And they're all linked together. And, of course, the, the period of midlife is that one of those, what they call these days, perfect storms where you've got all of this going on in your body, your, your endocrine system, your, your hormone system. And also around you, you may have changes in your work. You may have changes in your relationship. If you've got children around you, they may be leaving home, which is causing you worry or distress. They may not be leaving home, which might be causing you worry or distress. You could have older people around you who are needing increased care and support at this time. And of course, at the time this is recorded during the pandemic, that's absolutely hugely so for many many people yeah it adds another dimension doesn't it, it adds a huge other layer. dimension so when women were asked what would help them uh what they said the number one was to talk to other women going through the menopause so that was the highest nearly a hundred percent of that of women uh was they wanted to talk to other women going through it uh, to have more information about the menopause uh, over 90 percent to talk to somebody about how I'm feeling, nearly 90%. Interestingly, almost three quarters of women have said they want management awareness of the menopause within the working environment and information and advice from their employer about the menopause and what was available and to have access at work to networks and or training. Over half of women said that's what they wanted. And that, that is getting increasingly popular. When we first started doing work on midlife with our clients, it was based around the menopause demystified session that I run half day session just for, for women. Then we introduced one called supporting people during the menopause that this talk is based on, which we co-deliver. And what we find now, interestingly, is about 75% of the attendees are male, which is very positive. It's a really good sign that you know men who, who are line managing groups of women are taking an active step in wanting to find out more about this and, and being a good manager, being the benchmark that other other people, male or female, within that organization can can follow. And of course, even if we are managing a position, we have colleagues around us who are going through it. Um, almost everyone, I'll say almost because I don't want to be challenged on the statistics but almost everyone has women in their lives whether it's a mother or an auntie a next door neighbor a friend mm -hmm. at the tiddly winks club or whatever who potentially are going through the menopause so we strongly believe that men should be aware of what's going on women themselves should be aware because it's quite surprising how many don't are not aware of what's going on within them it's it's not surprising it is you know there are different ways of looking at that and what we're seeking to do, and of course, we also run a course for men at midlife because uh, some of the stuff is very similar and some of the stuff for men is different. Uh, the critical thing is that's lagging the menopause things by probably by a couple of years. Uh, we're in the forefront of both and the, the male side, we're trying to do, encourage the conversation to get going and really push it home. It is really important um, because despite the complete chaos and mayhem that the menopausal transition can create for, for many women who are experiencing it, the suicide rate in men at midlife is three times higher than it is for women. So it is really important that men are included in the midlife conversation. And it isn't just about the menopause, but it's about men at midlife as well. It's really important. And it's, it's critical that we know what's going on with everybody else, not just the men or not just the women or whatever. It's really important. And we've had young people come along uh, we had one young guy who came along, his parents had split up due to his mother's dreadful menopause. And he said, I want to come along today because I wanted to find out about it so that I can support my partner when she gets to that age. Fantastic. We need more people like that. We do. Anyway, moving on. So we're a very small group. We would, we would have put you into breakout <laughs> rooms now, but it, it, you might be very small number in each breakout room. So let's have a general discussion about organizations that you might be aware of don't give any organization names necessarily but you know how close do you think organizations are to meeting what women want and need during the menopause transition do you know of any organizations or anything that well, don't name organizations of course do you know of anyone who's doing anything particularly good and share what they're doing and where are the opportunities for things to get better 
Well, for me, I've, I've only come across the conversation about menopause at work, um, in work, <laughs> for where I work. I've, right. not, I've not seen it for any other, you know, in any other organisation. Um, so, yeah, so for me, it's just in my place of work, where I currently work at the moment. Right, okay. And without naming names or pointing fingers, it, you know, are things at work starting to happen, or is there lots and lots of room for improvement? Um, I think there's probably a lack of awareness that that the about the support that's available, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I suppose to a certain extent, you know, some women may not want to talk about what they're going through, sure. or may not feel as if they can talk about what they're yes. going through. So, I think your your last point is really important mm -hmm. because until we can normalise the conversation. Yeah. You know, I can come to work or I can phone in and I can talk about breaking my leg. Let's hope nobody does, but you know what I mean? Or I've got food poisoning or something. We can phone up, we can talk about that. Mm. But we feel it's embarrassing or we feel in some way stymied from talking about things like the menopause and possibly period issues around menstruation and periods. And mental health. And also. mental health, although that's yeah. improving. So our objective is to normalise this conversation. It's a natural phase that... It, virtually every woman will go through and it should you know people should be aware and we should support women going through it because it is a transitory phase great thank you um i think for me just just to dip in on that the organization that i work for they are getting more proactive Excellent. um um the union have pushed or have made them more aware especially HR and there are a lot of information about it um, but it's just for that to be be more widely circulated amongst the staff right um, the union have also done lunchtime talks we've arranged lunchtime talks for staff to attend and not just for members of the union but you know for the whole organization Excellent. but it's how that information is put is um is circulated and pushed through yeah. and again just agreeing with what leisha says it's not many people who really want to talk about it mm -hmm. and say what's happening to them because you get the the conversations that come around with here we go again you're having women's trouble that sort of thing um and it's just, and also for it's genuinely, there are issues which may be from, um, um, for some staff who are from um, ethnic minorities, black staff, they may have um, the, the relationship with their managers or the way that they're perceived is different and it's the way they're treated differently. And it's they're always open or subject to performances. Right. So that's a, a barrier and that's a hinder for them. So they just sit and suffer in silence. Sadly, yeah. that's something yeah. we hear a lot. And when I do that, the, the menopause demystified half-day session with a group of women, it's the the relief in the room is tangible that they realize one, that they're not alone. Two, they're not going mad. And three, they are able to talk about it openly and they have other women go, oh my goodness, you as well. So it's not just me. And the relief to actually be able to share what they're experiencing. And something really worrying that I hear frequently from women is how many women are lying to their employer when they don't feel able to go into work that day because they, they believe, rightly or wrongly, that they are working for an organization where the culture is not supportive of them being able to be open and share and say, I'm going through the menopause at the moment. 99 days out of 100, I'm fine. Today, I'm not. But they don't feel able to say that. So they are phoning in sick and, and using another excuse. And they feel dreadful for doing that. So you're absolutely right, Sharon. It's a real issue around being able to change that culture and make it an acceptable conversation to be had. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the main thing every... is fitness performance. Pardon? I think one of the main thing is the sickness performance, right? Yes. Which yes. obviously, a lot of organisation they do have 
that and it triggers mm -hmm. and it's because of maybe the the impact that has had on that person the night before the sleepless night yeah. Yeah. and you know that you know you know not doing that sort of thing and it it sort of then comes back and hit them because they're yeah. they're going back into the cycle of that sickness performance yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and it it happens in in all organizations and at all levels we do work with big city law firms with banks and things building societies and we find that women there don't want to talk about it because they're scared that their male colleagues might use it as another stick to beat them with oh it's with like you said oh it's women's problems again or uh, you know they aren't they aren't strong or whatever the rubbish is that might be thrown at them mm -hmm. And we, you know, it's mental health was like that five, ten years ago. We are at last, we're far away from it, but we're moving in the right direction. And we need to move in that direction with the menopause and midlife in general. So that people realize if you aren't affected, and we've heard stories of women GPs telling their yeah. patients, oh, I went through the menopause, yeah. it, it was easy. You know, just get over yourself, get on with it. And, you know, for that GP, I guess th that was true. But maybe for the woman who's presenting to that GP, she may be in that that poor top 25% of women who are really, really suffering, maybe even feeling suicidal or so badly affected that they can't perform in their work or any other form. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I was going to say there's a lack of empathy mm -hmm. with women managers. Yes. And yes. You're right. Even, yeah. And I think even some of those women manager who themselves might be going through it or have had the, you know, that yes. experience i think they're just going ahead with the policies that the organization has so they have they're ticking the boxes mm -hmm. and there's no empathy or looking at other ways that they could help though to get the best out of the employee absolutely and and that's, yeah. that's a really good link to what we're going to talk about just now so yeah. thank you for thank that you. sharon so what we're going to look at now is the different reasons that it's worth doing something. Why bother with doing something about women going through the menopause? For me, there's only one good reason, and that is it's the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do. You know, we should all support everybody. We have a duty of care to everybody in the organization. But there is also a legal case, and there's obviously a business case. And for me, the business case is is part of that first one the logic of why you'd want to do it so let's just have a quick look at, at those different ones so we think 52 percent as we, we know around 52 percent of the population are, are female that's a well-known statistic what you may not be aware of is that around 57 percent of that 52 percent are between the age of women are between the ages of 40 to 60 which are the key midlife and menopausal years so it is a lot of women we're talking about and as we've already mentioned, not every woman will experience pregnancy and childbirth. Yet every woman, if she lives to the right age, will experience the menopause. So it is about having a duty of care to all employees, not just women going through the menopause, but all employees, regardless of age, gender, or anything else. Organizations have a duty of care. There are no, currently, there are, there are no uh, specific laws or acts covering the menopause specifically. However, it is covered under the acts that you see there. Interestingly, if a woman feels she has a claim to take her employer to employee tribunal, either for uh, unfair dismissal or for treatments whilst at work, the current most effective route is to use the Disability Act. And I remember when I first heard that, I did. Um, react quite negatively because my, my reaction was, you know, the menopause is not a disability. <laughs> so this really is this message really isn't helping. However, by using the Disability Act is successful, it's because a woman is deemed to be temporarily disabled by the severity of her symptoms. So that's how the law will use the Disability Act to bring a successful employee tribunal. It is being debated. It was debated last year in Parliament that there should be specific. Uh, policies and guidelines in place uh, under the law to cover the menopause that uh, currently don't exist and we will possibly argue that just to have it in the menopause is maybe not uh, as inclusive as it should be and there should be if they're going to bring something like that in it should be to cover everybody at midlife not just women but you know that's our view on diversity and inclusion we, we, we want to keep information as we, as we go on but 
you know, the menopause obviously can have a really dramatic effect on everybody around the woman and, of course, the poor woman herself going through it. And, you know, others are affected. Men are also affected by midlife. The, it's different, and yet in some ways it's similar. It may be not as obvious, and as Katie said, the threefold increase in the, in the rate of male suicide at midlife has got to be something we should think about really, really carefully. So there have been some employee tribunals. Uh, the ones that we are aware of that have all gone in favour of the claimant uh, go back to 2012, one in 2018, and the most recent that we are aware of was last year. And all of them went in favour of the claimant. Uh, there may be others that are currently happening where um, a decision has yet to be reached, but we're aware of those three that all went in favour of the claimant. And as women become more aware of their rights in law, uh, covering what they are experiencing, going through the menopausal transition, the chances are that these employee tribunals will increase. And what we're trying to do is raise awareness and stop that needing to be the case. We you know, head it off as the part at the pass, as they say. We want to stop the need for it to go to a tribunal so everybody understands what's going on. The woman going through it can be supported as best as possible. And we all come out the other end happy and moving forwards. And that's what that's what our objective is in running these sessions. So to give you some stats of the menopause uh, business case, um, uh, sorry, just, thank you. Uh, ONS statistics of January 2020 said that 72.3% of women are in, in employment and four and a half million are between the ages of 50 to 64. 64. And women within that age group are the fastest growing economically active group, which is really interesting. And there is an estimated absence related cost to UK business uh, of a study done in 2017 of £7.3 million. And from a 2016 survey, one in four women said they consider leaving their job during this life transition. We would argue with the conversations that we have that that's likely to be more than one in four, because I frequently hear, certainly in menopause demystified of women who have changed their jobs, had a high flying job, um, high profile job, really loved it, was really good at it, felt unable to do the job as well as they felt they should be doing it, didn't feel able to have that conversation within the working environment because they didn't think they would be heard, understood or supported and ended up leaving that job and doing something else, going part time. Uh, and really missing what they knew they were really, really good at. So it, it, it's shocking how many women not only consider, but actually do leave their job. And of course, the estimated absence related cost, 7.3 million, is, is very big. And it is highly likely to be grossly underestimated. If you bear in mind that women probably find it difficult or impossible to tell their employer the truth around what's going on, then that figure is likely to be, we would think, considerably higher. So why would an organisation invest time and money at the beginning of a woman's career or man's career and when they have 20, maybe 25 years of experience, expertise invested in that person um, within that organisation, why would they then abandon that person when she reaches her midlife years, her midlife transition and risk losing all of that experience, all of that expertise and all of that talent potentially to a competitor who is rather more business savvy? And has a much better culture. So as we know, we represent roughly 52% of the population. So this is not a minority issue. This is a huge issue. And it is just common sense. If there is no good business model that would agree that abandoning a woman when she has 20, 25 years of expertise and talent behind her, how is that ever going to be a good, good business model? It simply doesn't stack up. We talked about the you know, experience of knowing people around us earlier. So just out of interest, have you ever tried to talk about the menopause with someone that you work with or someone around you? If you did, how did the discussion go? Was it easy? Was it difficult? Um, how did they react? Um, what, you know, if, if there was something that might have been done differently, what, what could it have been that could have been done differently? And if you haven't done that, how do you think you might approach that discussion? 
I haven't had that discussion at work with any of my colleagues, um, but mm -hmm. the reason I chose to come to this workshop is because, well, 100% of one of my teams is are all women of different ages. Oh. Right. Um, and I would say at times it feels like there's a bit of a divide between maybe the younger women and the older women. Okay. And I'm wanting to bridge that gap. Um, yeah. So we're talking a lot around, we're trying to normalize the conversation about well-being, mental mm -hmm. health. And I'd like to introduce this conversation as part of that. Excellent. Right. That sounds like an excellent idea. Yeah. And uh, we, we find that, of course, there's the odd thing about that is these younger women, assuming they live, to the to the right age which let's hope they do they're going to go through it as well so it's kind of you know this is in your interest to get to know what's going on here because if you know let's hope you don't have a rough time but if you do then getting yourself empowered and that's what katie's when she runs the menopause demystified courses that's what we're doing we're empowering people we're giving them the information the knowledge and the ability to take take control of their own lives and do something about it and move forward in a positive way. But the chances are, even if they are too young to be experiencing it, their mothers, aunts, older sisters, uh, maybe. And also, from what you said, their colleagues are as well. Yeah, their so, colleagues are. You know, what yeah. have you got to lose? <laughs> I, I suspect there are colleagues in my team who may well be going through it, but not saying right. anything. Right. And yeah. even, okay. um, for, for that particular team, um, we're responsible for training. So in uh -huh. terms of... Um, you know, their position as uh, they have a leadership position in a way within sure. the organization where they can reach out and share information with other women. Yeah. Right. The organization, not necessarily. That's so, so important. So important yeah. because the more we can spread the word, the more we can get the conversation normalized and people talking about it, the better it's going to be for everybody involved. Absolutely. So let, let's have a look at um, what we can do about a conversation. Now, obviously, the, the top bullet point on this one is stating the obvious, but we'll say it anyway. All conversations, regardless of what it is, and of course, particularly maybe the menopause or sensitive things like that, should be non-threatening. They should be respectful. The intention should be to be supportive and inclusive. So given those givens, how can we go about starting a conversation? Well, the first thing to think about is we don't actually know unless the woman has told us and she knows herself that it is the menopause that's, that's going on. So there could be a wealth of other things. There could be a bereavement in the family. She, there could be issues with, I don't know, difficult teenagers. There could be issues with relationships. There could be a whole host of things that might be causing some change. And what we're looking at here is you know the people around you, you know the people you're working with, you know your friends and those people around you, and you're looking for a change in their normal. Okay, don't ask me what normal is, but you know what the normal reaction of someone's going to be to these circumstances, or how well they work, how many mistakes they make, do they normally forget things? And if you see a change in that, then I would, particularly as a manager or a leader, it's your responsibility, your duty of care to people to find out what's going on to support and help them. So you notice there's a change and you think, ah, oh, I wonder what's going on here. I wonder if there's something we can do support to support the person. And I wonder you know, how we can get this. What we're trying to avoid, obviously, is this tribunal situation where someone's job is at risk. They go on some performance management thing or they're, you know, they're actually threatened or actually are made unemployed as a result and that's what we're trying to avoid so how do we do that so we would suggest the best way is to start off with a gen very gentle conversation and maybe you know open the conversation obviously in an appropriate place with you know as a one-to-one -one. it's not something you would do in the middle of a crowded office or, or you know around the, the water cooler or something and just ask very gentle questions you know, oh I, you know, i've noticed you seem to be a bit bit, bit more tired than normal you know, is there something going on in your life, you know, in life that may be, may be causing that? And see what they say. And you, in, if they will respond, then you can build up a picture of what might be going on. They may tell you something that's totally unrelated to the menopause. But bear in mind that the perimenopause starts anything up to 10 years before the actual technical date of the menopause, menopause which is a, a technical issue for the medical profession just for convenience. So they may themselves may not be aware of what's going on. And the number of women we work with 
and we so we talk about itchy skin. You talk about you know various other things. And, oh, that's to do with the menopause. I never realised. So we're not always aware of what's going on ourselves if we aren't adequately informed and empowered. So if that doesn't work, then you kind of kind of notch it up one, and be gentle but inquiry. You know, well, you know what? I, I, you seem to be making more mistakes than you normally do. It's really not like you. You know, what's going on? You know, do you think? You know, what do you think might be causing this? And try and encourage them and engage with them in a conversation. Because what we're trying to do is not to put them on the spot and make them feel even worse than they probably are already or maybe already. And we're not trying to cause trouble. We're trying to find that middle ground where we can work together to try and overcome these, these temporary problems. Excuse me, minute, someone is just joining us. Right. If that doesn't work, and we hope obviously that number one works, and if number two doesn't work, then we have to be a little bit more what, what we're calling observational. So, you know, I've noticed, people have noticed, it has been noticed that, dot, 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 and then try and, and, and get them to respond to that. The real objective is to get them to respond so that you can work with them in a positive and supportive way. Sadly, if none of that works, and they are resistant to discussion and and it is threatening their job or the organization in some way so i don't know maybe they they may be on the phone to to people all day long and maybe they're getting they're being you know a little bit rude or sharper than they would be or not as supportive as they would be and it that's been noticed you want to do something about it before the complaints start coming in Maybe they're a bit more forgetful than they were, and you don't want that to turn into a performance issue. So it's always with the intent of doing the right thing and supporting the, the woman going through the menopause. But if none of the gentle ways work, then maybe to avoid that situation of performance management or go, it going to some sort of dismissal or reprimand, you might have to be more direct and say, look, you know, I've noticed this, other people have noticed this, something is going on. I want to work with you to try and see how we can get through this together, but I can only do that if we can discuss it. You know, obviously, if you don't feel like discussing it with me, there are other people that you could discuss it with, if there are other people to discuss it with. But there may come a time, we hope that's not true, but there may come a time when you have to be more direct. So just to, to summarize, Avoid open-ended questions, one, sorry, avoid closed questions, one that invite, invite a yes or no answer. Are you okay? Yes. No. Well, that tells you a little bit, but it doesn't tell you much and it doesn't help the conversation to get going. So if you say, oh, how are you feeling today? Oh, a bit down. Ah, well, you've got something and then you can take that a bit down. Oh, a bit down. I'm really sorry to hear that. You know, is something going on that's making you feel like that? You know, is there something that we can help you with? So you get the conversation going and you allow the person, the woman in this instance, to explore things for herself. Because if she isn't aware of what's going on, this might be quite a revelation, which might, might not actually help the situation terribly well. So you want to give her space in this instance, her space to develop personal awareness and take ownership of what's going on, because then you can work together to put the right things in place to support her and get through it together in a positive way. So what sort of things can be done? So we were going to do a poll, but we'll just um, have you all chipping in now. Welcome, Christine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what, what is your view on these two questions? Should organizations introduce a menopause stroke midlife policy? Yes or no? What's your view on the first one? Or both of them. Or both of them. Should organizations introduce a midlife menopause guidelines? The managers, yes or no? Oh. oh. So it should be, you should be able to. Uh, Hopefully, you've answer. got some question and answer thing on the screen if you just click yes or no. Oh, 50 50 split. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. So there's, I'm not sure that we can get the next question up. And Okay, brilliant. Thank you. That's a 50-50 split. So, um, um, what about... No, okay, I think we've, we've done that. Right. Um, so, really, the, the question is, 
Oh, okay. So if you, given your views on policy, what about your your views on just having guidelines rather than actual policies? And you, you should have that on your screen now. Hasn't come up yet. That hasn't come up. Oh, okay. Has that come up? Yeah, got it. Ah, brilliant. Ah, Technology is a wonderful thing. Ah, 100%. Right, excellent. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, 50 50. 50 50. Okay. Yeah, this is usually what we get yeah, when we're live is. with people as well. We get a split, so a split answer. There, are, there is no real, really, honestly, there's no yes, no answer to either of these questions. It will depend on so many things. It's a bit unfair to ask you, really, but it's interesting to find out what your thoughts are. You could have a policy in place for the menopause or midlife, but we were working with an organization recently and they said, well, we've got a policy in place for pregnancy and childbirth. We've got a policy in place for adopting a child and very, very few people ever adopt a child, but it, it is used very occasionally, but we haven't got anything for the menopause and that affects probably 80% of our workforce. Mm -hmm. So we should probably have a policy for that. That's an interesting yeah. view. Then, So then I was being very provocative. I said, well, if you have one for the menopause, do you have one for issues around menstruation, around periods and things like that? Or oh, we don't. So then the question is, well, should this be a general well-being policy which mentions a number of different things? And if you don't want to go, it depends on your organization's view of policies, whether these are rules and regulations or whether they are effectively act as guidelines or whether they're strictly enforced. Or should you just have guidelines? When this happens, this is something you can do. Here's the, the information that's available. Here's the resources that are available. There's no answer, and it's trying to find the right thing for the people yeah. within the organization and the organization itself. Absolutely. Bit of an unfair question, but we like, like asking unfair questions because it's fun. <laughs> we get great answers. It is, yes. So what could be done in the office where possible, when we're all back in the office, bearing in mind that very few people are actually currently office-based at the moment. Well, flexible and agile working, obviously with the current global situation, is pretty much ticks a box for everybody at the moment. But when we are back in an office, actually being able to maintain that as much as possible is something that not only helps um, men and women at midlife, but actually can be helpful for everybody. Some reasonable adjustments for when people are back in the office and sharing office space again is easily accessible outside space, having access to windows. I mean, when you see them down in black and white here, they kind of look obvious, don't they? But it's amazing how many organisations, it doesn't even cross their mind to think about these things, working away from the heaters. And, you know, there is, as, as Roger mentioned at the beginning, it is, this is not about a woman up moving 100% to meet the needs and demands of her employer. Neither is it about the employer moving 100% to meet the demands of the woman. It is about collaboration and partnership to find that win-win. So if you have an open plan office of 10 people and only one of those people is going through the menopausal transition, is it fair to the other nine to have all the heaters switched off and all the windows open? Probably not. So how could you how could you find a reasonable adjustment that works for all 10 people, not nine and not one? So that, that is about the, the partnership and collaboration aspect. The reason the next one is in italics and in bold is because this is just as relevant now as it is for when we are back working in an office. There's no over, overly long meetings without breaks. For, for everybody, that's a good idea because mentally we can only absorb so much before we start to lose attention. But for women, when they're going through the menopausal transition and periods become very sporadic, a woman could go six months without any period at all, then have a light showing one week and then two weeks later have a complete flood. And the thing is, because they are so sporadic, we have, generally speaking, women have absolutely no idea when the next, when or even if the next period is going to arrive and what that period is going to be like. And I have heard so many horror stories of women who are locked in really long meetings and they get that feeling and they just know. And I think, oh, no. And they are rooted to the chair. They say, I have to stay sitting because I can't get up. I have to wait for everybody else to leave. And of course, from that moment, that woman is no longer listening to a single word that is being said because she has gone into a meltdown of absolute panic. So just building in those regular breaks in meetings, which allows a woman who knows what's going on and why should she have to share that with anybody? So that's really important. 
quiet areas where feeling overwhelmed, having access to drinking water. Now, the last one, you might think, well, everybody has easy access to food because we work in a building. But there are an awful lot of people whose job it is to be on the road. And we were working with a, a very large public sector organization. And one of the men attending this half day session said, oh, my goodness, I am actually in control of all of the care homes around the whole area. I can instantly open them up to every single member of staff whose job it is to be on the road, 80% of whom are women, that they can go to any of these care homes and use the facilities. Because, you know, if you're going through this and it can have a huge impact on our bladder and you're driving in a city, you don't know where the public loos are, you don't know where to park, have you got enough the right change, have you got time to, to pay for it on your phone, Does that, is that going to make you late? All of this panic goes in that is potentially going to have an impact on that woman's uh, mental well-being that day and also her productivity. So it looks like an easy thing, but actually it's such, it makes such a huge impact for how that woman feels about going about her daily life. So now, what can be done now? So the first one, again, is no, no overly long meetings without a break. So even though a woman is working from home, um, it's so important it's even more important for everybody now because actually working looking at a small screen is more tiring than being in an office so it's really important for everybody's well-being that we don't have overly long meetings without a break keeping that regular online contact just checking in to see how somebody is doing and asking them rather than telling them what they need asking them what they would like and what is needed in terms of the support the contact and the interaction which i'm sure you're all doing with everybody anyway and letting people know what is available internally and I think Lisa you mentioned at the beginning that there is a lot available within your organization but how that is communicated perhaps there is room for improvement in that. so if we think about they are the practical things that could be done but what could be done from a culture shift point of view if that is needed well, we can look at upskilling colleagues and line managers so this isn't just a line manager and a leadership issue this is about upskilling all colleagues about this natural life transition that they are either going through, may know somebody going through, or will eventually go through themselves when they reach the right age. It's about being supportive and non-judgmental in every area of diversity and inclusion, but it's making sure that menopause and midlife is included in that diversity and inclusion conversation. It's an understanding by everyone that this is a natural life transition. In the, in the East Far East, they refer to the menopause as the second spring. So it is seen as the start of the new beginning. It is not seen as the end of life. The end of life as we know it, but actually the life awaiting us as women is much brighter, much bigger and far more colorful than the life of being dictated to by our hormones. So it is actually a natural rite of passage for women that is in uh, over, over need of a serious PR makeover because it is one of the most powerful and potent times of our lives. I know as a postmenopausal woman, a nearly 61 year old postmenopausal woman, I'm a lot busier than I was when I was 30 and I have a lot more confidence than I was when I was at 30 and I'm far better at my job than I was when I was at 30. So it is about women owning this natural life transition and also owning the power and the potency that it gives us. As Roger said, it's about having that open and honest conversation. And for women, it's really important that we own this life transition and we name it. It's not the change, it's not the time of life, it's the menopause. So we have to own our experience. We have to own the word, the menopause, because if, as women, if we feel awkward and apprehensive of using the right terminology, it's almost guaranteed that everybody around us is gonna feel awkward too. So it actually has to come with women owning this natural life transition and by doing that we help to normalize the conversation and the, and the, the topic challenging inappropriate behavior is not obviously isn't just for this it's for absolutely anything if we ever witness inappropriate behavior and we don't challenge it we are giving the perpetrator permission to continue with that behavior and we are also making ourselves part of the problem so that's not just menopause and midlife that is around anything keeping that conversation going and working in partnership. We're stressing that again. This is about working in partnership with that woman, that member of staff and asking what they need rather than telling them what they need. So to finish, we want to find out what, if anything, could you do personally uh, and what might you commit to them? Like this quote, a healthy attitude is contagious, yes. but don't wait to catch it from someone else, spread it around. 
might be a bit sensitive at the <laughs> moment, but I think you get the philosophy behind it. Hopefully. <laughs> so things you could do, um, one, you could be an example of a supportive manager or a supportive colleague. You can help support people, be empathetic, point them in the right direction, put the subject on the agenda or keep it on the agenda where it's appropriate. If there are internal initiatives already, you could support them or you could kick some off. You could start them yourselves. Some people have resources available, some people don't. Maybe there are resources through an external organization like a healthcare organization for the company or, and of course the union. Signpost people to those if they need them. You could start a, a like a menopause cafe. You, somebody mentioned a, a lunchtime group. Start one of those or support it. Be a point of contact for other managers or other people, your staff or other people's staff. You could suggest to the organization appropriate changes and the rationale behind them and how it will benefit everyone, including the organization. You could be vocally, internally, obviously providing it doesn't threaten your own, your own position, your own job, and you could become a champion about the menopause. In one organization, a big organization, the senior the CEO, if you like, is the menopause champion. He's a man. What a better person could you have to be the menopause champion? That really opens it up to everyone and says everything about it. So if you've been interested in any of this, we run a number of sessions. Uh, these are half day normally. This is only really a very brief taster. The Menopause Demystified, which Katie delivers. So it's by a woman for women, and that allows the appropriate conversations and sharing to take place. I run the Mastering Male Midlife for men, and that's the reason, again, for that. It's not that we don't want you know, any gender to at attend anything. Actually, we'd love it, but then that stops participants participating and getting the most out of it. So that's the only reason we do it. This session, a full half day delivered by us, both supporting people during the menopause. And we have another one called Embracing Midlife, which helps people to celebrate midlife, learn about it, and plan their future. We use a fascinating uh, centuries old Japanese technique for planning your future in that. We produce a free, free e-newsletter every quarter and there's an email address there. If you'd like to be added to the mailing list, obviously for GDPR purposes, we need you to request it. Just pop us an email at info at rdpn.com and we will be delighted to send you the current copy, whatever that might be, and put you on the mailing list for the next, the next issue. The next one is due out very soon at the time of this recording. So thank you all very much for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you for your interactions and your contributions. We've really enjoyed it and we hope you've got something out of it. Do you have any immediate questions? We, we can take around. Not for me, thanks. Okay, cool. Brilliant, Thanks, anything, yes. make a note of our email addresses and the info at and anything that pops up or you'd like to discuss further, then do please drop us an email. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Thank and you. have a good rest of conference. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.